Welcome everyone to Slow Art Friday. Uh, my name is Paige Taylor and I'm the Learning and Engagement Assistant at the Asheville Art Museum. And I'm happy to be joined by Doris Potash, Master Docent, and Carol Fallender, Touring Docent, on uh, this year's, today, uh, this year's Slow Art Day. Slow Art Day is a global event with a simple mission to help more people discover for themselves the joy of looking at and loving art. One day each year, people all over the world visit local museums and galleries to look at art slowly. Participants look at one or a few artworks with one simple goal, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Doris and Carol will be leading us on an interactive conversation about three artworks from our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so on each artwork and Doris and Carol will allow us time to look at each work on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Doris, Carol, myself, and each other throughout the hour. And just a reminder, um, when you join, your um, microphones are automatically muted, but um, we welcome you to unmute yourselves as um, our conversation begins. Um, please choose a quiet room and close the door and remember to silence um, uh, alerts from devices. Try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or strong light source. Use headphones or a microphone for best sound quality and a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best viewing. Make sure your screen name includes your first and last name or your first name and last initial. Um, we welcome you to unmute yourselves again as, this, as our conversation begins, um, or you can type comments and questions into the chat box or uh, raise your hand, um, your real hand, or you can use the um, raise hand um, option in Zoom. And just a reminder, we are recording. So if you prefer not to be part of the recording, you're welcome to turn off your camera and or audio. And you can participate through the chat box. Are there any questions before we begin? And just a reminder, you can you should be able to unmute yourselves now. Okay. Um, okay, well, Doris, Carol, what will we be talking about today? Well, hi everybody, I'm gonna lead off our conversation and it's so fun to see so many of you that, that are my friends uh, and the rest of you who aren't yet my friends, but uh, I look forward to getting to know you. Um, we're delighted to be with you this afternoon and, and appreciate your spending part of your afternoon with us. Uh, Doris and Paige and I were chatting earlier that uh, a rainy day seems to uh, uh, encourage this even more so. Um, as, as Paige said, I'm Carol Fallender. I'm a touring docent along with Doris Potash, a master docent. And earlier Doris said it was a year ago today on Slow Art Day 2020 that the Asheville Art Museum did its first virtual visit. So we, here we are a year later, we've learned a lot um, and we're doing it again. Um, for those of you um, who may not know, the Asheville Art Museum also holds a Slow Art Friday, um, almost every Friday at noon, and they've been doing that for much of the last year. So um, there are more opportunities to do slow art. I think it's kind of cool that we're part of a global uh, slow art uh, day. Um, probably three weeks ago, Doris and I sat in on a conversation with people from across the country and really from around the world. I think there was someone there from Iceland and somebody from Sweden and um, just to talk about this movement and the opportunity to slow down, to take in, to savor and to share what you see. Um, and of course, as you all know, um, but always good to be reminded, there are no rights or wrongs. We're interested in what you see, uh, why you comment on that, and, um, and then to have somebody else bounce off of that idea. So, so that's how we hope to spend this next hour together. We are literally linking arms in spirit with others. 
we will be looking at three artworks, all of whom, all of which are in the um, Asheville Art Museum's collection. And all of them um, have some connection, we think, with springtime, with um, new growth, new budding, new greening, the water that brings that, that to us, and a time of renewal. So with that beginning, Paige, would you show us the first artwork, please? And we'll take about 30 seconds just to look. Okay, Let, let's begin and let's start with what's going on in this artwork. And please un unmute yourselves. I see trees and water and mm -hmm. um, I'm struck by the, um, the shades and the toning of the orange trees in the foreground where they're lighter and then darker at the top and the edges, as well as the green in the middle on that little island, it appears to be a little island or marsh out there with it, as it goes from light to darker as the trees go taller. So, uh, so the trees, the greening, the shading, um, as the, the colors change. Um, it reminds me a bit of, of your background, Laurel. I, I was struck by the uh, trying to figure out what time of day it would be because uh, from the clouds in the sky and the sky being so white, maybe it's a rainy day like today um, and there are so many reflections in the water then there should be a light source. So I was kind of wondering about the time of the day that it was representing. Do you have a guess, Barbara? I'm going to say it's a rainy day like today, the lake. I don't know. Um, because it doesn't look like sundown or sunset, and it doesn't seem particularly sunny because you're focusing, the focus is more on the color of the foliage. It seems muted in a way. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes me think it might be a cloudy day. Okay. And so Joel, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I, I'm a inveterate gardener. I love getting my hands in and sculpting, you know, my garden. And what I was touched by is the fact that this looks like no human hand has had any part of it. And, you know, I find that very, very moving that in this case, nature really does a far more beautiful job um, than, than we will with our little spades and shovels and our, our supplies from Lowe's and all that. Um, and, um, and the fact that these little outcroppings, these little islands are just um, coming up out of this water, it looks like maybe the tide is in, it can't be very deep. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that, that this foliage has just come of its own with no help from any of us. So I, was, I, I feel very moved by that. Yeah. So sort of nature untouched mm -hmm. and the beauty of that. Um, yes. Good, thank you. Others, what do you see? To me, it's just a very tranquil scene. We've mm -hmm. got just those high puffy clouds and the water seems to be perfectly still, mm -hmm. like there's no breeze or anything. So back to uh, the previous comments about time of day, to me, and there's no real clues as, as she said, but to me, it's kind of like that late in the day when the breeze dies down and everything's kind of calm and, and that's what I see. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned late in the day and, and wondering about the time of day. Do you have a sense of what brought all this water? Is this tidal water? Is this after heavy rain? 
Um, is it on the shore? What's... Hmm. You know, the mountains in the distance kind of make me think this is more of a lake type water, um, body of water, because if it was the shore, I would expect to see the horizon out there, not the not the mountains in the distance. I think the absence of people, the absence of birds or animals or water folded, waterfowl, just kind of gives you, like Hank said, that tranquil feeling. You just focus on the reflections and the uh, the trees. It could be to me um, also. The minute you mentioned, you know, tidal basin, just the way the islands are there um, feels like, you know, perhaps that is the setting. Uh, but I was really struck by the, um, the fact that the water is, I mean, you clearly see it's water by those simple little brush strokes um, that what the artist has accomplished with you know, in my mind, it's less is more. Um, with keeping things so simple, um, it's really quite remarkable. It's not overworked for sure. <laughs> very simple, very calm, very serene. Mm -hmm. Is there anything here, of oh, Doris? I was just going to ask, um, because I've looked at this for a while before, and I still am not sure what those beige sort of yellowish beige mounds are in, f in the foreground of those red trees. Uh, yeah, right there. Is that like a pile of like a, a sand dune or something? I can't figure out what I that thought, is. I thought they might be rocks. Ah, yeah, could be too. Boulders, but they're pretty smooth. Well, and one thing related to that that popped out when I first looked at this work um, last night was the, the orange whatever it is to, on the right-hand side, I can't help but see a face in there. Two eyes and a nose or mouth. I see the same thing, the exact same thing. It's funny. Are there things in this artwork that make you think of spring? Yeah, I think the, uh, the transition of the colors, you know, some of the things are very muted while um, others are more intense. And I think that's a very, very indicative of spring. You know, if we look out in our yards right now, some things have just not even gotten the hint that spring is here while the rest are, you know, bursting forth. So mm -hmm. I felt that it was moving closer to the shore, the colors seem more intense. I hate to be an outlier, but to me, it seems a little fallish. Sorry, <laughs> because- that's okay. Because of the orange and the yellow of the grass, I'm sorry. I, you know, I could see the spring in it, but when my first impulse, when I first saw it, was it felt a little more like fall because of the orange and the. Uh, if this is grass, unless yeah. it's sand, unless it's sand, but um, I thought, well, because the green back there, maybe it is sand. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that makes it spring-like for me is the temperature. It feels warm to me. It feels like it's a warm day. And, and I'm kind of like Barbara in that when I looked at this, you know, I can't say that it, it, it says spring to me either. You know, all I can say is it's like Kathy said, it's warm and the trees have leaves, so we know it's not winter time. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I really couldn't identify a season. I think to me that the um, the water is a sign of of the water that we experience at springtime. I think a fall is much drier, um, and and I see springtime not just having uh, pinks and reds, but um, that that's where it looks like spring to me, but we do certainly associate orange with fall. So. Okay. What else do you see? What about the mood of this? Hank spoke to that a little bit. Other people um, have a reaction to how this artwork makes you feel. So this is Karen without a camera. Um, I, I see spring in that, 
you know, in the springtime, there are a lot of trees that start red and there's so many different shades of green. Um, so uh, if you look out and right now at springtime around in the Piedmont, of North Carolina, there are plenty of red orange trees before they turn green in the spring. So I do see spring. Do see spring. Thanks, Karen. Any other comments about season before we shift a bit more to mood? Just another observation of something that looks a little different to me, not necessarily related to season, but in the like close to um, the horizon line, um, about a quarter of the way from the right, it, it looks like a rock or something, um, and it has some you no know, right to the left of that. Yeah, it this looks one. like it's got some pattern in it, which I think is very interesting. Um, and it, it looks very similar to the pattern in the trees in the front. So I don't know whether that's just a rock with a texture to it or whether that is um, some type of plant life or something. I would like to ask the artist if this was something um, imagined or compiled from various scenes or if this was an actual scene like you went and you know we could see the chair and the the palette a little further back actually painting a scene that they saw or just something you know created laurel your your question makes me think that Paige, it might be a good time to put up the information about the artist and and i have a a comment related to a bit i read about him um, this artwork is called flood tide um, by arthur wesley dow and it is a woodcut on paper and fairly small, quite small actually, six and a half inches by eight and a quarter. Um, a, a question that came up, well, Dow was born in Northern Massachusetts um, on, in a coastal town. And the tide um, in, in the title certainly suggests that, that he's reflecting on a, a place he's seen or a place he, he has certainly experienced. Um, in his background, he had studied in Paris. Um, he, was, he was born in 1857 and he died in 22. In 1884, he moved to Paris to study and he was influenced there by Ernest Felinosa. Um, well, he was influenced later by Ernest Felinosa and he was the curator of Oriental art at the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. Um, and he introduced him to something called Floating World, which are Japanese woodblock prints. Dao went on um, to become an academic and is well known in the art world for his first book, which was called Composition. And it was a, a book that provided a series of exercises that taught how to manipulate line, color, and tonal relationships, also called noton, um, within a composition. He was the head of the art department at Columbia University Teachers College, where he promoted his ideas about composition. And then he wrote a second book called Composition, a series of exercises in art structure for the use of students and teachers. And this became a staple in art education. He stressed craftsmanship, the attention to details, and encouraged original compositions created through the elements and principles he developed. So a final question relating to Dao was, do you think that his artwork um, imitates nature and, or is, um, is a reflection of nature? And how does he accomplish one or the other, imitating or reflecting? Maybe because we just came off of Impressionist, it seems like an impression or a reflection to me because there is not a great deal of detail in how the leaves are, you know, exactly bi bio biologically correct. Uh, there's more of a, an impression of the, uh, of the feeling of nature. Yes, uh, that's a great question, Carol. Um, and the word that comes to my mind, definitely reflection, but also 
inspiration that he was inspired by nature to create this um, as opposed to it was reflecting versus uh, what were the two imitating imitating, imitating. Mm -hmm. yeah I don't I don't see the imitating I see more inspired by mm -hmm. uh, Anyone else? Yeah, I have to agree with Kathy. You know, what kind of leads me in that same direction is, is a, even though we know these are some kind of trees and shrubs and possibly rocks, they're still rather abstract. They're not, you know, it, too realistic. And then there were the two shapes that, that Doris pointed out in the background on the right that we don't really know what those are. So it's not really imitating nature as much as just reflection on nature and, and his impression. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, why don't we move on to the next one? And again, we'll spend a few minutes, or not minutes, um, about a minute, uh, looking and enjoying this before we talk about it. I invite you to um, begin by telling me what you see, and what's going on. A lot of green. I mean, it, it looks very springy. And um, at first I just see green. And then looking at it more closely, I start to see yellows and oranges and grays and whites and purples and all of these colors mingled together. And as I move back through the painting towards the top, I see a fence and some sort of a wall and I'd say a structure. I don't know if it's a house exactly or some sort of other structure. And uh, so that's what I see. Okay, good. Thanks, Laurel. What else is going on? Well, I, my original, the first one, I, I felt that it was very removed from any touch of humans. And this, obviously, although you don't see any humans, this is, this is groomed, there's a pathway. Um, obviously there must be some human contact nearby on the opposite side of the fence. Um, so I feel like, you know, we're moving into, this does evoke spring to me, um, but spring that's had a little help from um, a gardener, perhaps. And um, again, I get that, that impressionistic feeling. The colors are, are beautiful. I really, really love this. Not that you asked, but I do. <laughs> well, we care anyway. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I agree with you. I want to be there. I would like to have a, a chair and sit right there. But I don't know why my first impression when I saw it, because it looked like a garden gate. And it may, it not, maybe it's my early childhood background. It made me think of Farmer McGregor's garden because it, because it looks like there was a, there's a gate. And mm -hmm. um, a gate to the garden. It was, it's just lovely. I'd like to have this hanging in my house. Very Barbara, cool. you said you'd like to be there. Where would you put yourself? Well, I don't know. I don't want to squash any of the greenery, so I'd probably uh, <laughs> get a nice white Adirondack chair so I'd blend in and sit on the pathway and read a, read a novel. Mm, okay. Good. I can hear it. I can hear the buzz of the insects and the tweeting of the birds, and it, uh, it evokes... Um, a definite feeling of spring and how it smells and how it sounds. So colors and sounds and how it smells evokes a lot of the senses. Yeah. Do 
Anyone else? What do you see going on here? Well, see, uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Kathy. No, go ahead, Kathy. And then <laughs> it, Doris. Um, it's very soft is the way I felt um, when I first saw it, just soft. And yes, I can see the ladybugs and little butterflies and um, all kinds of things in there. Um, I'm also struck by the square frame, the square shape of the can canvas, I'm assuming, um, because many landscapes are horizontal and this is just square and it just sort of draws you right into it, I think. I'm glad that you noticed the, the shape. It is unusual, I think, that it is square. And for you, Kathy, you said that square shape draws you in. Uh, yes, perhaps like, a, you know, not a peephole, but a window. Um, uh, perhaps, yes, it feels a little bit um, uh, special, secret, I don't know. Huh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This garden, I think, has a feeling of a secret place. Mm -hmm. Doris, you were going to add something before? Is that yes, um, it just, um, it seems, even though the colors are, 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 are sort of peaceful in it, and it does seem like a place you could go to relax, but with the way the brush strokes are going, and, you know, it just seems like there's a lot of movement to it, even though nothing's moving. Um, and I just was contrasting that with the other one, which just seemed, the one that you just talked about seemed really still. So they both seem like I would be relaxed in either place, but a very different kind of relaxation for me. I find it interesting. Oh, go ahead, Hank. Go ahead, Hank. I, I was just going to kind of agree with Doris and then I had that same feeling of of uh, the, the last image the last arc was so tranquil and there was so much solitude in there just a couple pieces of foliage a couple rocks whereas this is very busy lots of plantings and stuff that you could still lose yourself in here and part of that I think is because the way the artist has painted this the house or whatever that structure is and the wall or fence are very hidden behind the foliage. So it's almost like they're not part of the image. You know, it's all about nature and not the man-made structures in the back. Okay, so a very, very different feel and yet um, calming as well. Um, Sandy? Sandy? Yeah, well, thanks. when I sit back, I really enjoy it more. I see a 3D effect. And I almost get the idea that it's an abandoned garden because it's overgrown. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I absolutely love it, but I had to sit back to get that love. Good. I think it's interesting that the top of the house and the tops of the trees on the left are um, cut off and, and left mm -hmm. to our imagination, so to speak, that they're not that important, that, that even though it's a square, that the, we're missing something from the top. I don't feel that I'm missing anything left to right or along the bottom, but mm -hmm. you feel that that part has been uh, truncated there. And I think there's lots here, but, but, but let's name some of what describes spring from this artwork. What jumps out at you that says, oh, this is springtime here? There's cabbage, and I don't think cabbage is ripe in the spring, is it? Maybe cabbage. where you live. <laughs> cabbage is a cool weather crop. Uh, okay. Yeah, in Montana, we don't have cabbage till near the end of the season. <laughs> Welcome from Montana. <laughs> Well, I see flowers, um, not being a gardener, I couldn't tell you what they are, but um, around the, um, that white uh, structure that looks like it might be part of a fence or, or something there, um, some colored dots there that look like um, something's blossoming, which reminds me of spring, late spring maybe. 
And also the colors, there's so many different varieties of green, but some of them is that very new green that trees have at the very beginning of spring. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the trees in the left-hand corner are lighter. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be um, that new green to it uh, that you find in the spring. For me, there's also a, a mistiness of, of feeling, a dampness that, that comes with spring. Um, you know, summer is much hotter mm. earlier, so, so that adds to it for me as well. Okay. And I, the amount of green makes me think of spring because, you know, spring is, I think, the greenest season out there because as we progress into summer, some things do begin to turn brown, and then as we go farther and farther, mm -hmm. there's less and less green. So the fact that green mm -hmm. is such a dominant feature of this work kind of makes me think of spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is probably going to sound kind of wacky, but I'm looking at the, um, the perspective from which this is presented, and I feel almost like I'm a rabbit crouching here in the foreground <laughs> because... You know, because yeah. because as it goes as it goes further back, there's the house. But here's my little head in whatever this is. If it's cabbage, well then, yum. Farmer <laughs> so, McGregor's garden. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I love that sense of of hiding under the leaves, Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this garden. Um, does this look like a cared for garden? Does this look like an abandoned garden? Um, do you think um, the gardener is close by? What are your feelings about this, this place and, and how it fits in the landscape beyond? To me, it does seem a little bit overgrown. So it could be the style, the you know, English cottage, kind of a wild garden. Um, but when I look at some of the trees or the bushes towards the fence, they don't look groomed. So perhaps uh, they don't look pruned or anything. Um, so perhaps it's, um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's abandoned, but um, uh, it looks a bit overgrown. I agree about the overgrown. It's almost to me a mixture of nature and man, like that certain things were planted there and then kind of left to grow on their own. And others were um, grown there by nature not being specifically planted. So. I'm not sure if I'm right about this, but I remember from learning it somewhere that a typical English garden is kind of left that way to be, you know, like things are planted, but then they're not manicured. Like a French garden would be more manicured. So maybe it's just an English garden. Uh, being a little untended intentionally. Yeah, as a person who has planted so many things because I'm like, oh, this is beautiful, beautiful. Well, within two or three years, they're all crowded and it's so hard to say, oh, you go, you go, you go. So I could, I feel like this is the sort of garden <laughs> that I would, would cultivate. It is overgrown, but I think it would be heartbreaking to dig something out of it. You put it in and you love it and it's yes. there. Uh -huh. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I'm not going to have you shift to the details of the, about the artist just yet, Paige, but in reading about the artist, whose name was Twachman, he was described as a loner, as somebody who struggled with depression off and on throughout his adult life. And knowing that, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you see any of his sadness or depression or isolation mm -hmm. reflected in this work, and if so, how? You know, one thing that related to that is Kathy had asked in the chat a little bit earlier about both mine and Doris's comments about um, these two, this and the last work, and even though they were different. Thank you, muted. Hank, you're muted. There you go. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, uh, you know, one 
this kind of relates to what Kathy typed in the chat earlier that, you know, Doris and I both thought there was relaxation there. And she was quite, even they were very different paintings, she was thought that was kind of interesting. And for me, what makes them both relaxing is the absence of people. Um, you know, they're both pretty much strictly nature and I'm an introvert, so I'm perfectly fine to be by myself. So I kind of see that same isolation in this work that you talked about. There's nobody here. It's all just nature. Uh, Karen. And, uh, Karen. Oh, yes. Karen yeah, added to that in the chat that it seems like a solitary garden. And it's not a place for gatherings, but more of a place for solitude. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Okay. So the lack of human contact doesn't make it feel lonely, just makes it feel quiet and calmer. Um, Sandy, was that your hand? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'm really glad you brought that up about the artist because now, now I really do see a dark side of it. And I see like the Van Gogh craziness of the strokes um, in, in the cabbage and everywhere actually. Um, and now I, I don't see peace, the peacefulness. Um, I, I do see a Van Gogh-like mentality here. Uh, and I found that very interesting how my brain could shift like that, just knowing the truth of this man. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Kathy, I, I thought I saw your hand, if you'd yeah, like to ask. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm struck by how we all bring so much um, of ourselves into the dialogue because, um, you know, what, when Hank said that he's an introvert, um, I was thinking of the house that the fact that when you mentioned uh, the artist, you know, was, um, you know, had some depression and such, that uh, the house is hidden. And perhaps he, he, he would like that um, to be in a very, very private um, house because perhaps he's comfortable with solitude. So, you know, and, and I, I can get into solitude sometimes as well. Um, so, you know, to me, it didn't become dark. Um, I, you know, although depression is certainly, you know, not a healthy state, um, but uh, the house, the cottage itself seemed um, very hidden. And the point is that people who suffer from depression aren't depressed all the time because he could have painted this on a happy day when he was appreciating the spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do agree that the house is dark in the background, but I think the point to realize is that people who do experience depression aren't always depressed. And mm -hmm. sometimes if it's seasonal and light related, mm -hmm. maybe the spring was a happy time for, for this artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just adding to that, you can obviously be a loner without struggling with depression and you can struggle with depression without being a loner. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely true. Well, Paige, would you put up the, the background information and we'll just talk a little bit about, about John Henry Twachman. This piece is called The Cabbage Patch. It's an oil on canvas by John Henry Twachman, born in um, 1890. Those dates are wrong. Born in 1853, and he died in 1902. Um, he and and let me just comment. Um, earlier, someone said it's square, and it is. And he liked that idea of of um, that size canvas. And I'll I'll share a little bit more with you about about why. He was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he died in Gloucester, Mass. Um, at, at a fairly young age, um, in his late 40s. He studied in Munich in 1875, where he acquired skills in modeling forms, dark tonality, and brushwork. He then moved on to Venice, where he did some more studying, and then on to Paris in the 1880s. He studied at the Academy Julien, and his painting there shifted towards a soft gray, green, tonalist style. Impressed by the Impressionists, he moved towards a lighter palette and more abstract simplification of forms. He moved back to the United States to New York in 1887. And uh, shortly after that, he taught painting at the Art Students League in New York. 
and he continued to live in New York until his death in 1902. And he was inspired also, like Dao, by Japanese prints. He preferred to paint what he called close-ups. He called them little bits um, rather than a broad panorama. And he liked to use a square canvas because he felt it stabilized the image, that, that it wasn't either horizontal, suggesting movement, nor vertical, but that the squareness was just a little slice of this tiny, bigger world. Um, and I think this artwork reflects that, that um, appreciation of his so well. Okay, um, let's look at the third work and I'll turn it over to Doris. I just have to tell you, it's snowing like crazy where I live. <laughs> oh my gosh. Gotta tell you, it's nice out there where you live, but I could not take the cold. <laughs> I like the 60, 60 degrees, um, even though it's a little cloudy today here in Asheville. <laughs> All right, well, this is quite different from the ones that we've looked at so far today. So take um, you know, about a half a minute. Take it all in. So what's going on in this artwork? Well, to me, it looks like the farmer has just finished planting his field and he's kind of happy with himself. He seems yeah. self-satisfied. And um, the thing that stands out and makes this so different is the lack of uh, color. Definitely. Okay, so it is different. It, it, it's not colored. Um, and you say he looks happy with himself. And um, what is it that makes you think he's just finished um, working in the field? I would say his the way he has his hands on his hip and his uh, shovel is down the way it is. And, and he's at a, at a high point and it seems that he's observing his work. That's how it seems to me. And he does have a smile on his face. It's almost like he's posing for a photograph. Yeah, so he looks like yeah. he's posing, hands on his hands on his hips, um, like uh, self satisfied uh, between that and the expression on his face. What else do you notice? Well, I was going to say, um, it doesn't even look like he's done any work. He's so neat and clean, <laughs> and the, the field is so neat and clean. He hasn't he hasn't dug very much there with his shovel, but uh, it almost looks like a Thomas Hart Benton where the the figure is very different in uh, its dynamics uh, against the rest of the painting. Yeah, so uh, Thomas Hart Benton, another uh, printmaker um, from around that same era, actually. Um, this is not though, this is a different artist. So to me, looks this looks like, this is Karen. Um, to me, it looks like he's put in all those fence posts all yeah, I noticed, noticed the yeah. fence posts to the fence posts to the left and coming yep. kind of up that hill. And then behind him is one that he maybe just put in because it's still askew and not into its position mm -hmm. yet. And he's proud of what he's done. Yeah, so that expression might indicate pride in, in his work at getting all of those fence posts in or almost completed. And he must own the land. Uh, this is so different from the man with the hoe where it's a peasant working for peanuts. He's very proud of his farm. So the, the expression um, you're interpreting as, as, as pride and uh, perhaps because this is his piece of land that yeah. he's working on. <coughs> what other details do you notice here? Something is uh, very out of perspective here though in my way of thinking. I know figures in front would be much larger than the little house in the background and the sheep, but I don't know, it's almost like he's standing on a ledge above the rest of the painting. He's, yeah, he's yeah, the comp from composition, it looks like he's yeah, very, almost on a, on a hill or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. He does with take up a lot of space <laughs> in that artwork. He looks extra large, you know, in, in the front. I mean, he's the yeah. dominant in the foreground, but extra large in proportion to the house on the left. And I'm almost wondering if there's a building on the right there in the back 
it, it another form that is yes right there i don't know what that is exactly but um again the proportion is um very different very striking yeah. And so what, what do you think the artist is trying to tell us um, with that proportion of that figure? I think there's a, a reason for that or just... Uh, mm -hmm. I think the proportion having that big figure in the foreground of the, the farmer and the way the perspective is, is done in this work, that it just really makes that expanse look bigger than it really is. So it emphasizes the, um, the size of his property, perhaps? <laughs> Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'm struck by is that, you know, the previous two pictures, the first one was just nature completely untouched and then nature um, obviously coaxed by humans. But this one is pretty much for him, he's in control of spring. There isn't going to be mm -hmm. any spring growth if this guy isn't doing what he's doing. And, and it, for the the entire landscape around him, it looks like there are a couple of different, um, I'm pointing, you can't see me, <laughs> a couple of different um, farms, um, as well as, you know, he's responsible for these, um, I think they're cows over there. Yeah, in the, oh, on the left there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, in, in this case, we are completely dependent on this man to bring spring to this farm. Yeah, so you see much more control, much more yes. human, the human hand um, in this uh, this landscape, in this scene, than um, in the other in the other artworks that we looked at. Kathy what, also commented in the chat. Uh, Kathy, I, I assume you're referring to the composition that it uh, puts emphasis on depth and strength, or focus on depth and strength. Yes, this painting mm -hmm. um, with the three. Um, three items that are in the far background. Um, on the right, it could almost be a city. Uh, then there's another cluster in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the um, barn or farmhouse over there. And um, it, it feels almost like this artwork is a statement um, of a time and maybe even, um, you know, a political or socio sociological um statement it just seems to have more behind it um than uh depicting um just not just but depicting a man in the fields yeah thanks kathy i'll give you um a, a little bit of a um a, a build a little bit on on your comment there um this work was created in 1939 so it was um toward the end of the depression um, and shortly before the war. And so, you know, Kathy pointed out a little bit um, about, I think, re refer referencing that this must mean something or, or uh, represent something. So what do you think the artist um, may be trying to tell us with this? Because Kathy mentioned propaganda. Mm -hmm. Not that it necessarily is, but I'm, I'm sort of picking up on her comment. Is there anything that, um, any message you think is, is coming from the artist. Yeah, I think maybe to um, a value of the American farmer. Uh, mm -hmm. Look how proud you can be of what you're accomplishing. Uh, look how proud you can be of owning land. Um, you know, it, it's kind of almost like a, uh, yeah, like a propaganda piece for, you know, I mean, he's not wonderfully dressed or anything, so you don't get the impression that he's going to get a lot of riches out of this, but certainly that he is a very proud person, and you could be proud of yourself if you were he. Yeah, so maybe the importance of that agrarian uh, yeah. rural, rural lifestyle. Exactly. Right. Do, 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 can you, do you get any sense from the landscape as to what part of the country this might be? Something very Barbara? flat. <laughs> very <All right>. flat. <laughs> Barbara, you had a comment? I was going to say um, it might be something like some of the WPA stuff that you see, some of the murals right. that the mm -hmm. WPA uh, produced during that period of time where a lot of artists were employed by the government to, you know, well, it was for propaganda for, for hard work and, you know, fruits of your labor. And, um, uh, and I agree it's someplace very flat like like the Midwest where, where you can mm. plant uh, weed and corn and stuff like that. And 
Yeah, there was a, a comment from Karen in the chat that said the, the heartland and that that does kind of evoke that that part of the, the, the country. Um, so um, I think you can put up some information now on on the artist. So uh, the title no, is in the spring. So this one actually had spring in the title. Um, it's Grant Wood. You may be familiar with his iconic uh, painting of the uh, the farmer and his daughter with the you know holding up the pitchfork and yeah, you know the very probably one of the most um, recognizable paintings um, of, of American life. So this is Grant Wood. It's a lithograph. Um, it's not really large. Um, as you can see, it's eight and, and seven eighths by 11 and seven eighths. Um, even though it kind of gives you that sense, as you said, of this expansive expansiveness. Um, uh, one of our um, former uh, curators said uh, a quote from her is, I like how Wood has drawn his farmer towering over the landscape, and you pointed that out, um, cheerfully setting boundaries on his land through hand dug fence posts. Um, so he's kind of saying, you know, this is mine and this is, you know, I'm proud that this is my property, which again, I think um, some of you had pointed out earlier. And she says it makes her think of the saying, good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> so um, he, uh, Grant Wood was um, born in 1891 and he died um, shortly after he completed this print in 1942. He spent most of his life in Cedar Rapids. Uh, he went to Chicago in 1916 to study at the Art Institute, but he ran out of money, so he had to leave there. In the uh, 1920s, from 22 to 28, he made four trips to Europe to study modern art in Paris and Munich. And uh, he painted that iconic painting, American Gothic, in 1930, so well before uh, this print was uh, um, created. Um, he's considered a, an American regionalist, um, and um, he uses a lot of the Midwest rural themes um, and certainly uh, showing um, a rejection of abstraction. I think this is fairly, you know, it has a little sense of abstraction, but not like the European abstraction that he would have encountered in, in Paris and Munich at the time. Um, he was, um, he, although he had an early marriage, he was uh, um, thought perhaps to have been gay and was trying to, um, again, given the times, conceal this um, throughout his life and that caused, um, apparently caused him to be um, a bit stressed um, in his private life. So um, it's a Grant Wood that I would have never figured was a Grant Wood. I, someone mentioned WPA and given the timing of this, I thought perhaps he might have been a, a WPA artist, but I looked at a list of WPA artists and I couldn't find them on there. So uh, he may have been uh, just maybe a little um, um, too uh, early um, to be a, a, a part of that. So I want to thank you all for um, your participation today on this wonderful Slow Art Day. It was wonderful, as Carol said earlier, to see some um, people that I see regularly in Slow Art, but also some, um, some new visitors and some visitors from Missoula, <laughs> which is always fun. And um, I don't know, um, Paige, if you have a little bit to tell us about mm -hmm. what's coming up. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Carol and Doris. That was a wonderful conversation. And thank you all for joining us and, and uh, making this conversation so good. Um, I Yes, we have a Slow Art Friday coming up next Friday on April the 16th. And uh, our docents Kay Dunn and Rolinda Laurie will be leading us in a conversation about repetition in art. So uh, I will be sending out an evaluation shortly uh, with a link to that. Um, so you're, we welcome you to sign up if you haven't already. And uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Enjoy that spring weather, snow and rain. <laughs> <laughs> Please, no snow, not in Asheville. <laughs> <laughs>